So, we're really excited to have you guys listening today. Thank you so much for tuning into the College Alternative Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking with Natalie Johnson, who's a county health inspector, and she's going to be talking about how to help businesses, individuals, entrepreneurs can get in contact with the health department, what they're going to be looking for, how are they relevant um, to a food enterprise, and also the regulations that they enforce. Um, it's, a, it's going to be a really wonderful conversation. Um, and, and the relevancy to you guys is the last thing you want to do is put a ton of time and money into an enterprise, forgetting about a health regulation. And instead of working from the onset with the health department, now you know, you've got uh, your, it's costing you time and money um, in your business uh, as you're correcting that problem. So, really looking forward to the conversation today, and I hope you are too. And this Interviews with the best in their fields, teaching you how to excel in careers that don't require traditional college. You're listening to the College Alternative Podcast. Insider tips and advice, straight from the experts. And now, here is your host, James Christian. Today, I'm really excited to have Natalie Johnson on uh, the line. uh, And we're going to be talking about uh, food inspection. So for any of you guys that are interested in... Uh, preparing food to take to farmers markets, or getting a food truck, or getting a restaurant, or a bakery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're eventually going to go through a person like Natalie to get certified here. So I'm really happy to have you on. So how are you doing today? Good, and thank you for having me. All right. So hey, how about you uh, start out with a little bit of your background, who you are, how long you've been working, where you work, etc. Okay. Uh, my name is Natalie. I work with Cochise County Environmental Health in Arizona. Um, I've been a health inspector with Cochise County since 2012. Um, we conduct, you know, different various types of inspections for, you know, not just restaurants, but other, other entities without the county as well. So that's that's a big deal because when you think of a health inspector or food inspector, you normally think about um, restaurants, right? You normally think about restaurants, but in reality, you you're inspecting quite a few other different different things. And the last thing you want is to invest all this time and money in recipes and marketing, and blah blah blah. And you come you come around and you're like, well, we need to change a few things, and that puts you behind on on your own personal business, right? Correct. <laughs> so, what is your what does your office do? What do you do specifically here? Uh, you said health inspector, but what does that really mean? Um, actually, what it is is we conduct various inspections for compliance and to educate the people or the public, you know, of the different delegation agreements and county sanitary code that would include the food code, ADHS, and ADEQ delegation agreements. Okay. So what, yeah, okay, so you're inspecting people for making sure what, that their their food is properly stored then? Yeah, for compliance relating to everything that's in the 2013 FDA food code. So not just for temperature control, but proper cooking to right temperatures, um, you know, that they're properly labeling and date marking their products that they are cooking for the public. Okay, okay. And then, yeah, so it's not just... Putting putting meat over you know on a shelf above your above your lettuce or anything like that. It's it's it's. I didn't know that. It's actually cooking techniques too. Correct. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and then, what type of locations do you inspect? You just said it's not just restaurants. Who else do you inspect? We also do hotel motel inspections. Uh, your B and Bs, which are your bed and breakfast, mobile home and RV park public and semi-public pools, waste haulers, or you would call them a septic pumper trucks. And we also do public nuisance complaints that are um, regarded to the Arizona Revised Statute of 36-601. Okay, so it's not just, wow, so you're, you're doing a lot more than just, like I just said, the restaurants. You're doing, you're doing what, sanitation? You're doing 
uh, pools, RV parks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Correct. That's that's ins- really okay. So I had no clue. So let's say I wanted to establish an RV park somewhere. I didn't even know that I really had to have, you know, a, a, a health inspector come around. I mean, that's just ignorance on my part, you know. Uh, but that's that's interesting. Okay. Um, and so you've been a, you've been a longtime veteran <laughs> since 2012. <laughs> you said. <laughs> What kind of training did you really need for the job, or what, um, how did you even get into it? What what made you what made you take the job? Um, what happened was before I actually started doing inspections, I worked for another county, and where I did um, behind the scenes stuff, mostly you know all the office in point, you know taking in plans, you know, uh, involving my doing the what would you say plan review processes with other people that wanted to start a business or along that line. So I did that part for several years first. And then um, when the position with this, with Cochise County came open, I decided I would apply for an inspector part of the position. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So the requirements would be, um, you would just need to make sure you're familiarized with the various codes, um, either already be a registered sanitarian or be an environmental health aide under the direct supervision of a registered sanitarian. Okay, okay. And then you were mentioning the pools and the RV park, et cetera. I can understand the beat, you know, the bed and breakfast, and you know, food related items. But um, how would I, as a business owner, really know if I need to have a health inspector come around? You know, uh, because that that kind of took me as a, as a little bit of a surprise. There, um, do I need to really? Do I need to go onto a website to see if my business needs to be health inspected? Or, or how do you guys outreach or make people aware of the need for you? Um, really what happens is, is for such like that, most businesses are already aware, you know, because whenever they go to apply for their, for a permit, whether it's through the city or through the local counties planning and zoning or building department, they usually will let them know, hey, you also need to notify the health department. And when it comes to mobile home parks, RV parks, we look at mostly for sanitation purposes, like, you know, no sewage is surfacing on the ground from any of the connections, you know, within the park. That's kind of what we do basically for our part is just to make sure that the park is staying, you know, clean and doesn't violate any other um, the sanitary codes that are uh, delegated to us from the state. I wouldn't really want to be a resident of uh, one of those RV parks that has a sewage. (laughs) (laughs) I think they'd lose business pretty quick. Um, Yeah. But that's good to know. That's good to know. So if you're if you're applying to run a business in, in the county or state or city, Normally, there's going to be something on the paperwork or the person's going to let you know, hey, in addition, because you're applying for blank, blank, blank business, you need to talk with the health health and safety department first, yeah. That is correct, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know because the last thing I want is, again, to you know, invest all this time and money into a business plan, into all this other stuff, and you know, now I have to go through you know, another series of requirements. You know, right. I'd rather know that up front. So that's good. That's mm-hmm. really, really good to know. Um, but the main thing we really wanted to concentrate today on is um, kitchens, food preparation, et cetera, for those people that, you know, like want to prep food for that farmer's market or that bakery or that restaurant, food truck, et cetera. Um, so when do people need a certified kitchen? Because I think that's kind of a given for, say, a restaurant, but people are probably more along the lines of, well, do I need one or do I not need one when it comes to, um, you know, making jam or selling something in a farmer, farmer's market. So when do you, when do you need a certified kitchen? Anytime that food is going to be prepared or going to be served or offered to the public, a permit, a permitted kitchen is required. Okay. Okay. So even let's say I wanted to make that jam or whatever, or like caramels or something like that. Is that, so I do need a certified kitchen even for that? Correct. Okay, okay. And then so um, are the requirements for a certified kitchen 
for for you know you're you were putting out all these you know state statutes and I'm assuming national statutes there too. Um, is it kind of across the board? So I'm interviewing out of Cochise County, but say the next county over, are they going to have different health requirements than what you guys? They are could. What okay. happens is most of the time everybody follows the basis of the the food the FDA food code, and okay. then some counties and states, depending on where you're located, may adopt or add to the food code and add in their own additional requirements. Ah, okay, okay. But you guys, I'm assuming you guys work with the people in your county to, you know, educate them on your specific requirements. So they're not just logging into FDA website. They're logging, they should be logging into your county website to look at specific yeah, and we actually adopt the adopted the 2013 FDA code by reference. So we actually mostly focus and we follow the 2013 FDA food code. Okay, okay. Are there some counties that are just go above and beyond pretty much? Or do they normally just... You follow? know, I'm not sure exactly what all the other counties, you know, what they have added or not onto their own part. Uh-huh. So I can't exactly say, you know... You would just have to, whatever county or state you're in, get contact your local health department to see what their own regulations are. Okay, okay. So definitely make sure it's a county thing. It's not mm-hmm. just state or federal. It's a county. So if you're thinking about doing this, and it's, a, it, it's wherever the location of the restaurant is. So let's say you, you live in the county over. It's the location of the actual restaurant for that county. Make sure to look Correct. There. Into there, okay. So yeah, in Arizona, yeah. it's delegated to the counties, correct? Oh, okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, and let's say you wanted to start a business, right? You're w- interested in making wedding wedding cakes, or f- farmers market food, or you know that food truck. Mm-hmm. How do you go about uh, setting up a certified kitchen, or how do you go about even finding a, a certified kitchen to cook from? The best thing is if you're thinking about doing that and want to start your own business relating to like that food or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, it's best to contact your local health department for to see what their regulations and requirements are. Because different, depending on what your menu item is, is going to determine on what your requirements may be. Oh, okay. So maybe the person that's doing the wedding cakes is going to be having a slightly different requirements than say somebody oh okay okay yeah and, and then would the health department have a list of certified kitchens that are available for say rental because if i'm just a small time guy and not not have a lot of investment and in, you know uh funding to create my own kitchen in my own restaurant you know i need to find someone i'm assuming i need to find someone else that already has a certified kitchen right Correct. You would actually, as far as certified kitchens, you're saying goes, you would actually would have to reach out to either a, a local business that already has a licensed kitchen and ask them if they would do an agreement of some sort to allow you to use their kitchen, which then at that point you would still need to contact your local health department because you have to get your own permit separate from the licensed permit that the current restaurant already has because you cannot work under their own licensing you would have to get your own oh really okay so let's okay so certified kitchen i want to rent space in either the back of a restaurant or i think you know i was looking around locally and there's not much but there are a few certified kitchens in the area uh, where you can just rent space so i i sign up through them i rent the space you know being all up and up here but you're saying in addition to that, I still need to reach out and contact, you know, the health department to, again, get a check mark off on my own business as well? Correct. Okay. Okay. And then, um, wow. Okay. I didn't even, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and I'm assuming, uh, do you need training uh, through the health department on how to properly cook food then too? What we actually look for, what we ha- require is with the FDA food code, it, it's that the person in charge or the manager would get what they call a serve safe managerial food safety certification. And then you would take that class. You would lo- we don't offer those classes 
and through the county, it's it's done outside of us. So you would have to either contact. Um, I know the U of A has a program that goes on, and they offer the class plus the testing to get that certification. Ah, okay. So you're saying anybody who wants to actually sell food, uh, prep food, has to take that course? Correct. Okay, okay. Um, interesting. <laughs> so, but it depends on what your food is consisting of, on whether or not the managerial, because it's based off of what you're doing as a business. Okay, so like... On if it's required. Okay, so can you name some examples? Like, what might I need that for? Well, usually the only time it's not required is if you're doing a home bakery. Oh, so like the wedding cakes that I was talking right. about. Right. Okay. Correct. But if you're doing anything beyond the scope of a baked good because of the risk classification and the is higher than doing, you know, just wedding cakes or baked goods, so you would have to get the we want to make sure that you're you know what you're doing as far as food safety goes. Okay, and so you need that certification. Um, how do you know of how long it might take to get something like this? Is it like a, a year long? I'm assuming it's not, but is it a year long class? You know, does it cost? No, usually of it's an eight, one 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 eight hour day, and then for the for the lecture part of it, and then you would come back another day, and you would take the test. Oh, okay, so that okay, so I, I feel kind of silly saying. Saying a year there. <laughs> so it's only, it's literally only eight hour class, which is giving you all the information you need. Okay, so that's not that, that bad. I mean, it's not like it's time intensive to say the yeah, least. Yeah, and then okay. each county may be different as far as food handler cards go. Cochise County doesn't require food handler cards because we do require the Serve Safe Manager certification. Some other counties may require the serve safe on top of each individual employee outside of the management also having food handlers. So, again, you would just have to contact whatever county or state that you're in to see what their requirements are for that. Oh, okay. So you need two certs, not for coaches, but you potentially you need two certifications, one for food Correct. prep and one for actually serving the food. Well, the manager of your establishment would have the managerial serve safe certification. Uh-huh. And the f- people, your empl- the employees that are actually back in the maybe helping with food prep or any of that, they would take and get a food handler's card. Oh, okay. It's okay. just a less, yeah. It's not okay. as, as intense as the manager certification. <laughs> nice. So... Let's say I wanted to set up a certified kitchen on my own. Um, I couldn't find one in my, my county or whatever. You know, maybe maybe I'm living in maybe a smaller rural community that just doesn't have, have access, where I don't have access to that. So um, could you set up a certified, is it possible or realistic to be able to set up a certified kitchen in your own home? No. Okay. And why because not? Because the, the, the FDA food code actually states that private homes and living or sleeping quarters um, are not to be, you know, you can't use conduct food establishment operations. The, the code of that would be 6-202-111 or 111. And it states that a private home, a room used as living or sleeping quarters, or an area directly opening into a room used as a living or sleeping quarters may not be used for conducting food establishment operations. Okay. So and technically you would actually have to have another, a commercial kitchen off the way from your home. Ah, uh, okay. So I either need to, you know, construct a building or, you know, some offsite to actually have something. Okay. Correct, so it does, yeah. it does sound easier probably to maybe approach a restaurant <laughs> or something like that to try to try to rent some space from mm. uh, but right. I know I know people are going to ask this. So how do you? What about a bed and breakfast? How does that, does that fall under a different regulation then? Yes, for oh, a bed okay. and breakfast, um, the how that works. What classifies as a bread and bre- bre- bed and breakfast is if they have um, if you have less six rooms or less and less than eighteen guests. 
and his home is owner occupied and breakfast is the only meal prepared. And then of course the placard posted at the registration area that the food is prepared in the kitchen that is not regulated and inspected by the regulatory authority. Then you can do a bread and back bread bed and breakfast. Then it, you would, that's how you would classify and not having to have the kitchen inspected. Oh, okay. So it's definitely, it sounds like it's definitely one of those things that, uh, has been very well written to, you know, this is what a bed and breakfast is. And this is how, you know, you can, you know, have a, a certified kitchen, et cetera, in, in that bed and breakfast. And you can't, it really definitely does exclude other people from kind of getting around, you know, preparing food for, for other purposes then. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any, is there any free training or you mentioned the managerial training, et cetera. Um, is there any training out there on, or information out there for setting up a certified kitchen? Let's say you wanted to actually try to do it. Um, or you wanted to say rent a commercial space and you wanted to say, is this guy legit or up and up? How would you, how would you go about uh, finding training to set up your own certified kitchen? The best thing to do as far as training goes, I'm not sure what other counties may or may not have, um, but it's best to definitely check with your local health department to see what their construction requirements are for a commercial kitchen. Um, also, you know, you'd want to make sure you contact your, your lo- the building department for any building and fire codes. Um, it's best just to work with your local health department. And then if you have a place that you're looking at that maybe is still is currently being operated still and you're wanting to use part of their kitchen, you know, we, we would enjoy, you know, more than welcome, sit down, visit with you guys, you know, or the person to see what they're wanting to try to help them on our own, you know, to get that going for them. Um, if it's a building that used to be an establishment at one point in time, but has been closed or whatever vacant for a long period of time, again, just call your local health department Sometimes a health inspector can, you know, set up a time, you know, with you on a date or whatever and meet you at that location and do a walkthrough with you to let you know what may be needed to be to bring it up to current code. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what might be the main components to an actual certified kitchen? What are you guys looking for? Components would mainly be... We really look for components we would look for. Again, you want to look, contact your local health department or look on their websites to see exactly what their requirements are. Mm-hmm. But examples of it would be like commercial NSF approved equipment. Make sure you have hand washing stations in all the areas that are going to be needed. You know, you have the proper wear washing, you know, which would be like a three bend sink is the main requirement, a dish machine. A dishwasher would be optional. It's not a requirement by us, but the three-bin sink is the main requirement. It sure helps, though. It it definitely sure helps. (laughs) Of course, (laughs) yes. With speed. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, and that's the biggest thing here, too, because, again, we're talking about a big investment of time, a big investment of money. Um, And I want to make sure, you know, when I'm approaching somebody who says, hey, I'll offer you space, I want to make sure, hey, that... uh, you know, I'm getting, I'm not getting a raw deal. I'm getting a good deal. And the last thing I want is for that kitchen to, you know, come under trouble or whatever. And I want to kind of recognize, you know, right off the bat that, uh, you know, they're on the up and up. But you're saying also you can always talk with a health inspector too about it, right? Uh, reach out to That health. is correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the easiest way to do it as well as, hey, is, are these guys legit? Have they had any, had any problems in the past, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Our biggest thing is always, always call us first before you, you go in somewhere and decide, oh, you know, I'm going to open a business and start doing stuff. Make sure you check with your local health department, building department, you know, and stuff like that, just to make sure that you are doing stuff correctly into current code. Mm -hmm. And, And are there any differences between, let's say, the required kitchens for a restaurant or a bakery, are there any difference between that kind of cluster versus food that's produced 
let's say for an offsite, let's say for a food truck or for, you know, that farmer's market activity, or are they pretty much all the same? Um, all the requirements for that are the same. Sometimes, you know, uh, food truck, we require them to have a commissary, which would be a place that they could store, you know, their bulk items or food and stuff because you're not, you know, not store inside your unit, but you have to store it out of what they call a commissary. Um, then all food is to be prepared on site, you know, in your food truck, because that is, again, your permitted facility would be your food truck itself for a food truck. Um, for a, a farmer's market, per se, all food has to be made on site at the farmer's market if you're going to cook and prepare food to sell to the public at your farmer's market. If you're doing jams, jellies, salsas, then that would be done in your commercial kitchen. Okay. And then you could you can take it once you make it in your label it and you do it in your commercial kitchen, you can sell it at a stand um, at a farmer's market. Yeah, but you're not inspecting the stand. You're expecting you're inspecting, you know, that commercial kitchen that they made those jams or jellies there. Correct. I and then be if you're interviewing going around lunchtime right now, I really shouldn't. <laughs> And then if you're going to give samples at a farmer's market, then you still have to meet the requirements set up at a temporary, as a temporary event set up, as a temporary vendor, you would meet, you would have to set up according to those temporary vendor requirements. Ah, and and do you need to have a food hand or food servers uh, license for that too, if you're selling? Yeah, you would actually, if you're, yes, you would get it. What we offer is either if you're just doing it one time, It'd be a temporary food vendor application one time, or if you want to do it at multiple events throughout the year, just in Cochise County, we offer an annual temporary vendor application. And that application allows you to do, you know, multiple events or that for during that year within our county. Oh, okay. So it's, you label it as an event versus an actual, like, established location. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then food trucks. So, you know, um, that's, have, have you guys had to inspect many food trucks in Cochise County at all? Uh, yes. In, really? more, in certain parts of the county have more food trucks than others. Mm-hmm. Okay. And is that, something that, um, is that something that's kind of unique for you guys? I mean, it's a mobile kitchen on wheels, essentially, right? So. Correct. And they're prepping food off-site. They're cooking in the actual vehicle itself. Does that kind of lead to a little bit of, um, oh, I'm trying to describe it here. Um, you're, not, you're not just preparing it all in one specific spot like a local restaurant, right? You're, you're handling the food. You're moving the food. You're cooking the food again. Um, is that kind of more unique for you to have to inspect? Is it a, no, because a, a food difficulty? truck kitchen is exactly an establishment on wheels. So they have to have the exact same setup that a restaurant would have inside the fixed facility. Okay. Just in a smaller, more compact space for you guys. Correct. And then again, all their food prep, all their stuff is done in their unit. Okay. And how often are you inspecting these facilities? Is it just kind of random or is there a minimum amount of inspections you have to do? We actually do um, risk-based inspections, and by depending on what risk you are would determine on the number of inspections you get a year. So, for example, like your Circle K's, uh, dollar stores, those would be considered a risk one because they don't do any food preparation at all. They just do cold holding of items. Usually, except for Circle K, may reheat hot dogs or something. They're reheating something, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's it's a low risk. It's usually considered a low risk. So they usually average one one inspection a year. Unless we get complaints, then we would go back, you know, as needed. Um, schools and some of your places like bakeries, those are considered risk too. So then they would go as two times a year because it's a lower risk. They usually cook what they cook for that day, and then whatever's left over, they discard at the end of the day. Ah, so, so they're, it's not, yeah, being, they're not reusing it? Okay. Correct. A risk three would be your full-service restaurants. Those are the ones that may cook large items. They have to do proper cooling. Then they reheat, and they do it with multiple items. 
food items, so then they would go a minimum of three times a year. Ah, okay. And then we go up to a risk four, which are your food processors, your hospitals, preschools, daycares, because the population that they serve is more highly susceptible. And for food processors, they have a specific plan and process that they have to give to us for review and it's more risky. So they would go four times a year. And then I have a certified kitchen. Do you give me notice, like a couple days notice that you're going to be showing up or do you No, just they randomly? are surprised. Yep. They're surprised visits. Okay. And then how long do these inspections normally take? Um, I'm sure a smaller uh, space is going to take shorter, you know, larger space is going to take longer, but Let's say for an average restaurant or a food truck, et cetera, how long would it, it typically de- take? Yeah, it can vary um, most of the time anywhere from an hour, two hours, depending on what exactly what's being on going on inside that establishment. Mm-hmm. And during these inspections, you're working with the people, right? I mean, you're you're not just pointing out all the flaws. You're you're providing education, right, to them. It, correct. Yes, we let them know what they're doing, and then we go over. The, the proper procedures, if we find anything that maybe mm-hmm. they need to fix at that point in time, correct. We try to do a lot of education at the same time when we do our inspection. Yeah, so it's not just a, you're naughty, I'm not going to, you know, it's not something to be scared of, right? Uh, food inspection. Absolutely. It's, it's something where, hey, they're coming by, they're going to educate me, and we're going to go through a plan as far as how to get, a, you know, us back up to code, right? That is correct. Okay. Well, that's good to know, too, because I I think people probably could get nervous when it comes to a health inspector. I could see that a little bit. And the reality here is you guys want to work with with your people to keep them them up to code and get them to that level that they need to be at. So that's good to know. Of course. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, So what point in the process of creating, let's say I have a brilliant idea for this food product, putting mayonnaise inside chocolate bars or whatever, and I'm going to sell them at, at the farmer's market. <laughs> uh, what, at what point of the process do I need to get a hold of this, the food inspector office? At the inspector? very beginning, when you first think of something or if you're wanting to do anything that's related to food or whatever, definitely contact your local health department right away because in that way they can make sure they give you all the right um, paperwork and requirements and help you through the process. Okay, so right from the very beginning. So you can put that into your business plan. Correct. Okay, awesome. And so what are some of the common mistakes that people make, that you see people make in their, in their kitchens? A lot of it's cross-contamination. They don't realize that whenever they finish one task that they need to remove their gloves or wash their hands in between every task. So, you know, if you're cutting raw chicken or whatever, before you go to cut your fruit or your vegetables, you definitely want to make sure that you go and you wash your hands properly before you start handling and doing another task. Um, Another thing is maybe not actually cooking foods to the right temperature, not following or checking it with a thermometer to make sure that you're going to the, you're cooking your stuff to the right temperature um, and improper cooling methods, that's another big one that we see a lot of. Oh, what, what, so what do you mean by improper cooking? Uh, you know, washing hands, gotcha, easy enough, right? Cooking things, you know, you just have your little thermometer, poop, put it in there, right? Make sure it's mm-hmm. internal temperature is good enough. But what do you, what, what do you mean by uh, cooling methods? Cooling method, um, you have to usually, like some restaurants will cook a big bulk of beans or something like that and they leave it in the big old pot, and they may leave it sit in the pot and just let it sit out on the counter to cool down or something, or just take that pot and put it right into their walk-in cooler or something along that line. But the real proper way is to put that stuff in a shallow pan and layer your shallow pan with just, you know, amount of it and put it either in an ice bath or, you know, a method along that line and to start frequently why it's in the ice bath to bring it down to the right temperatures within the right time frames to prevent any, any bacterial growth of that kind. Okay. 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 So that makes a lot more sense to me here. So 
meats, cooling them down, anything you're heating up, cooling it down, getting it through, I guess, a danger zone, so to speak. That is correct. Uh-huh. Okay, and getting it down to where what? You want it, what, do, what, uh, what temp do you want it below before those bacteria don't propagate? Well, the, the way it breaks down is, is you have from, from the temperature of 135 to 70 degrees, you have two hours to get it to that temperature. And then you have to get it from 70 degrees to 41 degrees or below within four hours. So those are the critical points is from 135 to 70 in two hours or less, or and then from 70 to 41 in four hours or less. Okay. And those are pretty, those are pretty big temperature drops when you really think about it. You know, just leaving it out in the air temperature, it's probably not going to do the trick. That amount Correct. of time. So I could definitely see putting in an ice bath is pretty much the only way you really can go with something like that. Does just throwing it in the fridge work for something like that, or do you have to put it in an ice bath to really get? Well, you're down? the best. You could probably some people may do it in their walk-in cooler, but they have to stir it, and a lot of times they'll keep a temperature log of their a cooling log of, you know, when they started the cooling process and what the temperature was at the beginning and then at this time and this time to make sure that they do meet those standards. Um, Sometimes your refrigerators, like your home refrigerator, of course, isn't adequate enough to cool something down. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't have the power. (laughs) Correct, yeah. So, yeah, so a lot of times people may put it in their walk-in or they may put it in their freezer to help try to bring it down to those temperatures. Okay. But so, definitely shallow pans are the, are the way to go. The way to go. Invest in shallow pans. Mm-hmm. Yes. So let's say you inspect a location and you find, and you find mistakes, right? Uh, let's say the cooling or, you know, uh, the meat above the, the, the vegetables, et cetera, et cetera, or it's a dirty facility. Um, what might be the consequences that you can impose upon these people? What are, what are they looking at as far as... You know. Well, it really depends on the violation that we find at the time. The con- the consequences or whatever, it can range anywhere from could they correct, you know, those violations on site at the time while we're still there with the inspection, or it can even go all the way to closure of your establishment. Okay, so kind of give me some examples here. So let's say I'm not washing my hands properly or cross-contamination. Is that something where you're going to shut down my, you know, shut down my facility? Um, more than likely, no, we'll go over hand washing. We'll make you discard the stuff that, that we witnessed or that we seen that was being cross-contaminated at that time. We would then go over with the employee and, of course, the manager on site of the proper, you know, um, requirements of proper, you know, sanitation of your countertops or whatever we observed at that point in time for cross-contamination as well as proper food handling. Okay. So, but I'm assuming could probably rattle off some really pretty serious violations you've probably seen um, <laughs> that have resulted in a lot lot more than just counseling or verbal counseling. It's I'm assuming what? You see, you know, rats or, or you know, that's kind of the go-to one or, or you know, really, really yeah. dirty facilities, A, then you actually need to step in a little bit further, right? That is correct. Yeah. So, and then, and then what? I mean, you just shut down the facility and that's it or... You, we can, actually, we them? can, you know, a lot of times we'll close them until they have it fixed, the, any issues, the issues that we've deemed, you know, that were an immediate, you know, health hazard or whatever. Then we would actually um, tell them, okay, well, the, you have to get it fixed. Once it's up to code, they've cleaned it or they've done what they're supposed to, they will call us or we will just make frequent visits to stop by to see their progress and see how it's going and if it's up to code and they meet it up, then we may reinstate and we let them reopen. Mm-hmm. But we would do an inspection prior to, to them being able to reopen. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like the common theme here is you are, and this is wonderful, the common theme here is you're working with people like me who or working with restaurants with more professional chefs, but you're also working with, with people like me who just want to, you know, open up that food truck or just want that bakery who may not, might not know as much as the guy who went to four years of culinary school. You're working with us to educate us on what, what requirements 
we're looking at here. And so that seems really, really good. Um, Education is the name of the game, I guess. <laughs> right? Yes, and that's our biggest thing is, you know, that, not are we out there just to protect the public, but we also want to educate and, and have the establishments do very well, and we want them to be educated on the proper proper code as well. Nice. So where do, where do people go? So Cochise County, uh, where, where can people go to find you guys? Or should they just stop in the office? Um, we're not always in the office. We don't always hold office hours. We usually do office hours by appointment. So if you're in the Bisbee, Douglas, Alfreda area, you would contact the Bisbee office. Um, if you're Huachuca City, Sierra Vista, Palominas, Hereford, um, Tombstone area, you would call the Sierra Vista office. And from Benson, Sunsight, Pierce, Dragoon, San Simone, Wilcox area, you would call the Benson, Arizona office. Okay. And would you recommend people, let's say they're in L.A. County or New York County, would you recommend they go to a website or stop in and make an actual appointment? I would probably have them call their local and health department and see if they can't set up an appointment. Okay. And then you're getting get real direct answers to actual specific questions. You're not trying to interpret statutes, which right. probably aren't, or maybe. Yeah, because we can give them copies. That's what we, yeah. We can tell them exactly where to reference to, um, you know, with whether it was with web links or highlight the code and then copy and paste it and send it to them in an email format or that that type of format. All right. Wonderful. Well, Natalie, thanks for sitting down and talking with us here. Um, anything else you'd like to add as far as food inspection or health inspection or, you know, establishing your own food, food uh, program, restaurants, et cetera? Um, the only thing I can just mainly say is definitely just call your local health department if you have questions because they're willing to help you and make sure that you can, you know, answer any questions you might have and hopefully be able to direct you in the right direction. All right. Wonderful. Yes. All right. Well, Natalie, again, thank you very much for coming on the show. You know, it, it, it is one of those things where, you know, you want to get people like you, people at the health office, health inspectors involved early. So you know what to expect and to to form that good relationship with you guys. That's wonderful. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having us. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. So I hope you learned a ton from Natalie Johnson. Really wonderful person. She really knows her stuff. And again, the last thing you want to do is be delayed in your business. So really just reach out to the health department. They're there to work with you and for you um, to help you understand health codes. So reach out to them early. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please post them below. If you have any ideas um, for future jobs that you want us to um, go in depth on, to interview an individual on, please comment below. We're always looking for new ideas. And also, um, if you have any interest in anything else, please uh, go to collegealternative.net. There we've got plenty of podcasts, interviews for you to listen to. So until next week, guys, take care.